I want to just speak to you about, obviously, the NATO summit that's taking place in Madrid right now. Boris Johnson overnight has pledged another billion pounds of military aid uh, from British taxpayers to uh, go to Ukraine, following a plea from President Zelensky uh, for more help. Now, this is dwarfed by the 33 billion that the American aid package includes, but certainly by far uh, the, the, the second biggest uh, um, supplier. Um, There's a billion pounds more. 2.3 billion is our total commitment. Um, instantly, when we talked about that, the reaction online was from people going, hold on a minute. What about the cost of living crisis here? Why do you have a billion extra for, for Ukraine, but you don't have a billion extra for people who are struggling here? Uh, as a Conservative MP, what do you have to say to that? Well, Julia, this is actually about the cost of living crisis. If you want to lower the price of food, if you want to lower the price of heating, uh, gas and, and, and petrol, you need to sort out the problem in Eastern Europe because actually the, the, the reality is the prices are rising because President Putin has uh, invaded a neighbouring country and is bringing war to Europe, which is closing off markets, which is closing off gas supplies, which is increasing the price of wheat and sunflower oil and many other things. So if you want to lower those prices, you need to win this war and win it quickly. And that's why supporting uh, Ukraine is absolutely essential to that. We need to make sure that the Ukrainians are in a position not to invade Moscow or do anything silly like that, but to negotiate from a position of strength uh, so that they can make the decisions for their own sovereignty, just as we should be able to make decisions on our own sovereignty. So this is fundamentally, I'm afraid, connected to the cost of living. I mean, and certainly also there is that concern that if uh, we don't help, Ukraine will fall. Uh, Russia, Vladimir Putin, gets his victory. And then we're in a scenario where um, he, does he move on elsewhere? Zelensky has been warning about this all this time. It's certainly very clear that NATO leader, you know, Jens Stoltenberg and, and many other, you know, NATO partners are very concerned in Baltics, uh, Polish, and of course the, the new about to be members, uh, Finland and Sweden as well. That's why they're joining NATO. Um, there is a genuine concern that if we don't stop Vladimir Putin now, we are going to face far greater costs in the future because we'll be fighting on NATO soil. Well, that's exactly right, Julia. You know, the reality is that uh, Vladimir Putin has spoken about the Russian-speaking minority in Lithuania and Estonia and Latvia, three NATO countries, in exactly the same way as he speaks about the Russian-speaking uh, communities inside Ukraine. Now, they don't want to be protected by him. He calls it protection. I, I think it's protection only in the same way as the mafia runs protection rackets. It's not real protection. Yeah. Uh, and if you think that the price of fuel and the price of food and the price of energy has gone up, because of this invasion into a small area of eastern Ukraine. You just wait and see what happens if uh, Vladimir Putin decides to use energy as a tool against us by switching off gas supplies and so on. So I'm really sorry that we have to do this, but I'm afraid we do. The reality is we don't always get the choice. Our enemy gets a choice. And in this circumstance, Vladimir Putin has forced us into a choice. Indeed. I, I was quite encouraged that NATO leaders uh, yesterday declared, uh, well, world leaders at NATO, that Russia is a direct threat to their security. It's I feel extraordinary to me in recent years that Russia has been talked about almost as a partner. NATO, of course, set up directly to, to counter the Russian offensive threat. Um, Joe Biden also announcing a greater military presence in Europe with sending more fighter jets uh, as well. Uh, Russia, in the meantime, has responded by saying that the, the moves to have Finland and Sweden join, of course, that huge uh, long Finnish border uh, with Russia. They called it destabilizing. What do you make of that? Well, it's only destabilizing if you're destabilized by democracy on your border. I mean, the reality is. <laughs> which, which they were with Ukraine. That was why they wanted to invade Ukraine, wasn't it? A successful That's country exactly on the border. Right. It's, it's only destabilising if you think the example of free people might undermine your ability to control your own people, which is, which, you know, if you're Vladimir Putin, it is destabilising yeah. because, of course, you know, yeah. his first victims are the Russian people. He's stolen off the Russian people for 20 years. He's murdered the Russian people for 20 years. You know, he's used his tools of uh, repression and violence against the Russian people for more than 20 years. So, you know, in that sense, yeah, sure. But it's not destabilizing in the sense that uh, NATO is expansive. NATO is not expansive. NATO is about free people standing together to defend themselves. That's all it does. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the idiots on the left and, and, the, and, the, and the Putin followers who claim that NATO is somehow aggressive are just speaking absolute rubbish. You know, the truth is NATO is what has kept us and many other people safe and free for 70, 80 years, and it's absolutely essential that we stand now with the people in Finland and Sweden who've decided for their own protection uh, to join this club. Indeed. Uh, can I ask you about some extraordinary words from the Formula uh, One the former boss, uh, Bernie Eccleston. He's done an interview this morning where he's talked about Vladimir Putin being a very good man. And he said he's a sensible person. Ukrainian President Zelensky should have listened to Putin to avoid war. Uh, and he said uh, he'd take a bullet for him.
he'd take a bullet for Vladimir Putin. What do you make of that? Well, I, frankly, I think Mr Eccleston's judgment is deeply questionable because what Putin was suggesting to uh, Zelensky was that he offered his entire country as slaves. Frankly, I don't think that's a, a rational uh, decision for a president. And I think President Zelensky has done uh, the extraordinarily brave and, uh, and correct thing, which is to stand, uh, to stand up to this extraordinary tyrant. You know, the reality is President Putin has used chemical weapons in Salisbury. He has used nuclear chemicals in London. You know, had those chemicals gone astray, they could easily have killed quite literally thousands of people here in the United Kingdom. I mean, easily thousands of people in the United Kingdom. I think what Bernie Eccleston is, is talking about is frankly practically traitorous. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more on that. Absolutely extraordinary words, aren't they? Um, let's just come back to the cost of living issue. We've spoken to Richard Walker, the Iceland managing director, and um, gobs, gobsmacking amount of money that uh, he said he's been spending on his energy bill, £65 million last year. OK, uh, you know, rather dwarfs the sort of two grand uh, on energy bills we're expecting uh, in our, our home bills this coming year. But uh, asking for the, the government to do more cutting tax, cutting VAT, fuel duty uh, on fuel would be absolutely vital, even if it was a temporary measure. My guest Brendan Chilton in the studio uh, on behalf of the Independent Business Network suggesting that. Do you think there's uh, going to be more pressure on the government and should they relinquish to, relent to that pressure to actually cut fuel duty, cut VAT on fuel? Because that is the number one thing that is affecting all of the inflationary pressures we've got at the moment. Yes, and I said so when I went to speak to the Northern Research Group of Conservative MPs about, what was it, 10 days ago or something well, like you, that. You turned up, the, you know, the Prime Minister didn't. Well, I can only speak for myself on these things. I think it happens to be important to support the party across the country. And um, and so what I was talking about there when I was asked about taxes was, yeah, I would lower taxes on fuel because you're absolutely right. The reality is that because fuel prices are now, I mean, I don't know what you're paying in your, in your petrol station, but I'm paying pretty much nearly two pounds a litre. You know, that means the Treasury is getting a hell of a lot more in tax because that tax is connect, collected as a percentage. So frankly, giving some of it back doesn't lower the tax take. What it does is it brings it back into line with the price uh, as it should be. So, you know, frankly, I think we should be making sure that we um, allow people to get to work, uh, prices they can afford, allow trucks to travel around the country to deliver food and whatever else goods, uh, prices that we can afford, because it's absolutely essential that we have an economy that works. Uh, and at the moment, you know, let's be honest, the price of fuel is providing an enormous break uh, yeah. to the growth of our economy. Indeed. Can I also ask you, we just heard from your little ones uh, are coughing there. You're in charge of a family breakfast time before a nursery and school. And as, a, as many parents are, as they're listening right now, uh, one of the uh, for your fellow MPs on the Labour bench is Stella Creasy. She brought her relatively newborn baby into the House of Commons and to speak at the Commons Chamber and, uh, for voting. Uh, she's demanded that uh, MPs, men and women, should be able to bring their babies into the House of Commons, into the chamber, even when they're speaking. Uh, this was uh, somewhat controversial at the time. Uh, this, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, the Commons Speaker, asked the Procedure Committee, a backbench uh, group of MPs, to uh, have a look at uh, whether a review of the rules. Uh, and they decided, after I understand an awful lot of women MPs went, uh, no thank you very much, uh, that actually no babies should not be brought into the Commons chamber. Do you agree? Uh, I do agree. Look, I've I've had to have my children in in Parliament at various points, and uh, you know, obviously I don't breastfeed. But the um, but I don't know. Who, I don't know anyone could do anything now. It's chest feeding now, Tom. Well, Julia, I, I'm afraid the biology doesn't doesn't actually allow me to do that. You know, so I will not have that sort of transphobia on my show, Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. You're you're supporting my rights. Um, the um, <laughs> Look, the, the, the reality is that the, the, the House of Commons Chamber is a place of work. Now, I, I have to um, duck in. Well, when they were smaller, I used to have to duck in and duck out uh, occasionally. I mean, it didn't happen all the time, but I did, did used to have to duck in and duck out. And now sometimes I have to uh, leave them in the office with the iPad and some, and some cartoons. Parents got to do what parents got to do. But don't you think this is, this is a really silly thing for... I mean, I've got such issues with Stella Chris on this. I think it's just mind-boggling egotism. You know, cleaners can't bring their kids to, to work. You know, taxi drivers, someone working at a factory, you know, manufacturing, they can't bring their kids to work. I bet you'd have an issue if the canteen staff were busy with their kids instead of serving her a cup of tea. The reality is this is such a sort of... Only someone, you know, privileged and middle class could be worried about bringing their baby into the chamber. Millions of people, there's just not an option. Everyone else on far lower wages, frankly, manages to arrange childcare. Well, frankly, childcare is a huge problem in our country yeah. and it's one of the things I have to see addressed. Um, you know, I can tell you that it, you know, it absorbs 
look, I'm relatively well paid, Juliet, but mm -hmm. the, the, the fact is it absorbs an enormous amount of my uh, salary, my after-tax salary. I'm sure it does for many people who are listening today. And I think that's another break on our economy, frankly. That just think of the number of people who could be contributing their intellect, their innovation, their ideas, uh, except for the fact that they're, you know, they're, they're, they're tied up at home. And now some people want to do that. That's yep. absolutely fantastic. Good on you. It's it's entirely your choice. And other people want to go out and do do other things. And so having, uh, you know, the ability to do that, to be free to make that choice, I think is, is actually really important for our economy and for the whole society. Tom Tickenak, you get back to the little ones. Thank you very much indeed. 819.